I want to talk to you today on a, a subject very close to me because it deals with one of the heroes of the Christian faith, and that is the Apostle Paul. And um, sometimes uh, we, there are people who stand up and say, we've got to modernize things. We've got to modernize the church. So, and and we, we've got to do things according to the changing culture and so on. Well, actually, I think we should get the church back to the first century so we'll know how to live in this 21st century. And because that old-time religion is also the new-time religion, and that new-time religion is also the all-time religion, and that all-time religion ought to be the any-time religion, and that any-time religion ought to be the every-time religion. So we want to know how to live and to operate in these last days. I want to take you to Acts chapter 20, and we're going to look at a passage beginning in verse 17. And to me, this is one of the most dramatic scenes in the church, the, the history of the church in the first century. Now, the Apostle Paul has been on his third missionary journey, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem. And he's been warned not to go back because everybody's telling him, look, your enemies are waiting for you there. They've got a conspiracy against you, and they're, they're going to arrest you, and you'll probably be killed. But he's determined to go, as we shall see. Well, he's on board of a ship, and the ship docks at a little port called Miletus. Now, that's just part of modern-day Turkey. Back then, it was... Asia, Asia Minor. And it wasn't far from the city of Ephesus. Now, on this third journey, Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. And while he was there, the entire area was uh, 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 converted. That, that is, they'd heard the gospel and the kingdom of God had spread over the whole area. Well, here he is in Miletus, and he takes the opportunity to send for the elders in the church at Ephesus to come down there and have a final visit with him. So there they are gathered, uh, Paul and the Ephesian elders, and they're walking down memory lane. They talk about all the good times they had together how God had poured out his blessings. They went over it all. And then here's what happened. Let's look in um, uh, chapter 20 of Acts. Look at verse, beginning in verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. Now, I want you to use your imagination because um, we see here these people in the bonds of love. They've been through some terrific times together and also some times of opposition They'd been through prayer meetings, evangelistic crusades. Together they had seen many, many victories in Jesus. And their hearts were knit together. And now they're having this final prayer meeting. They're all on their knees. And God moves in that prayer meeting. And there is a wonderfully sweet spirit there. And then, all of a sudden, as they're praying, they realize this is probably the last prayer meeting on earth they'll ever have with Paul the Apostle. And they began to weep. Now, that, that doesn't mean they just sobbed a little bit. The word here means they wept 
freely. I mean, the tears were flowing, and they began to hug Paul's neck. They were weeping, squeezing him, hugging him, because they know that on this earth, they'll probably never see him again. So then they walk with him down to the pier where the ship is, and Paul boards the ship, and as it begins to sail out, they're standing there just boo-hooing and weeping because their dear friend, their apostle, their pastor, Paul, is leaving, and he's going to be terribly missed. Now, I want to ask you, when you are gone, will you be missed? I mean, other than by your family. Are you going to be missed? Will it make any difference when you're gone? Will your departure cause a vacuum anywhere? Now, you are going. I assure you that. You are leaving. Now, you might move away from this city, but you're going either by rapture or you're going by death, but you're all going. And the question is, when you go, what difference will it make? Is your life going to live, uh, have any kind of impact? I heard about this guy in the hospital. He just had major surgery, and he was in the recovery room. And he woke up in the recovery room, and it was dark. All the, the windows were closed and covered with, with curtains, and the blinds were drawn. He signaled for the nurse to come in. So the nurse came in. He said, nurse, open the windows here. I want to see outside. Why are these blinds closed anyway? She said, now just calm down, sir. I closed those blinds, and I did it for purpose. You see, there's a big fire just across the street, and I didn't want you to wake up and think that the operation was not a success. <laughs> Well, some of us are going to wake up and find out that our life was not a success. We've wasted our life. And we're going to go out into eternity with a wasted life. And by the way, I want to tell you something. I hope you'll bear in mind. When you go, you're going to leave behind you all that you have. And you're going to take with you all that you are. When you leave this earth, you're going to leave behind all that you possess, everything you have, but you're going to take with you everything that you are. And I wonder, really, what will you take with you? Now, you know that when the world measures a person, the world measures people by their brains, by their strength, by their power, by their wealth. But that's not how God measures a person. How do you measure a person? I mean, what really counts? Now, <clears throat> you may, may think that this is crazy, but I assure you this is the truth. You've heard of the Guinness Book of World Records. Now, that has in it all the feats, all the deeds, and all the stuff that people who have done in this earth and the impact they've made. Now, I read this, and when I read it, I had to check it up, so I did, and it's true. There is this man in Guinness World Book of Records, and he, he lived in France. He was a Frenchman, and his name was Michel or Michael Lotito. Now, do you know what his claim to fame was? I'm telling you the truth. His claim to fame was eating, eating, <laughs> eating glass and eating metal. His nickname was Monsieur Mangletoot, which means he eats everything. <laughs> he eats all. Now, what he would do, he would grind up glass and metal, mix it up, I guess, with, it, with his porridge, <clears throat> and eat it, or whatever, however he did it. But that's what he ate. Now, I want to tell you, he ate an estimated nine tons 
of metal. He ate 18 bicycles. That's true. He ate 15 supermarket carts, and it took him four and a half days to eat each one of them. He ate six chandeliers. Now get this one. Believe it or not, he ate an airplane. Now, I'm not talking about one of the big jumbo jets, but this was is big enough, any airplane, Cessna 150 airplane, a whole airplane. <clears throat> he died in the year 2007 at the age of 57. His death certificate said he died of natural causes. <laughs> now, can you imagine this, this guy reporting to Jesus? And Jesus says, my son... What, what did you do down there on earth? Lord, I ate an airplane. <laughs> what a claim to fame. I mean, what really counts? What really matters? How do you measure a life? How do you measure a man or a woman? Well, let's go back to this 20th chapter of Acts, and you're going to find three things here that are the real measure of a person. How do you measure a person? Okay, first, you will measure a man by the manner of his life. By the manner of his life. Look at verses 17 through 19. And, and uh, here is what the Apostle Paul has to say about the way that he lived. Here's Miletus. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus. He called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived. You see, here's the manner of his life. You know the manner of life I lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Okay? Here's the manner of Paul's life. First of all, it was a life of humility. Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility. I believe with all my heart, nobody has a life worth living. Nobody has a life that can be called a great life, and there's no true greatness without True humility, serving the Lord with all humility. Now, what is humility anyway? Um, like the fellow wrote a book, Humility and How I Achieved It. Well, that's not real humility. Humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is not saying, well, I'm no good because that's not true about you. Jesus paid too great a price for you to say you're no good. I'll tell you who you are. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God if you're saved. And I tell you who you are. You are a prince, a king, a queen. Because the Bible says that he has made us a kingdom of priests. You're a holy priest. I'll tell you what else you are if you're saved. Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. So you're next of kin to the Holy Trinity. Don't get the idea that humility is not loving yourself. For the Bible says we're to love others as we love ourselves. And if you don't love you yourself, I'm afraid of you because you don't know how to love me. We're to love others as we love ourselves. What is humility? Humility is not degrading yourself. It is not putting yourself down. I'll tell you what humility is here. Humility is an honest estimation of yourself that says about you what God says about you. And it results primarily in serving Notice in verse 19, Paul said, here's my manner of life, serving the Lord with all humility. Now, that word serving 
is the verb form of the noun that means slave or bonds, bond servant, a slave. Do you know what the mark of humility is? Service, serving God, serving others. A humble person is a person who serves other people and serves the Lord with all humility. Now listen, when God measures a person's life, he does not measure that person's life by how many servants he has, but by how many people he serves. There's the difference. God measures your life not by how many servants you have, but by how many people you serve. Over in Romans chapter 12, verse 11, Paul said something else about serving the Lord. He said, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Did you know that word fervent is the word from which we get our English word zeal or zest? And you know what it literally means? Boiling. Boil. Keep your spirit at the boiling point. In other words, it means enthusiasm, zeal, excitement, passion. Serve the Lord with passion, with enthusiasm, and excitement. Somebody says, well, God can't use me. If you say that, I want to tell you something. You are insulting the grace of God. It is an insult for anybody to say, God cannot use me. You're cheapening the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. People say, well, if I could, if I could preach like so-and-so, if I had as much money as so-and-so, if I could sing like so-and-so, then I could really serve the Lord. Look, God is not, not concerned about all of that. God's concerned about how enthusiastic you are in serving him with what he has given you. So that is the mark of humility, serving the Lord with all humility. Now, there are a lot of people, I believe, a lot of people whose lives are going to amount to nothing more than zero, and i tell you why. They've never learned to serve. There are people who come to this church right here, Sunday after Sunday. They soak, but they don't serve. They need to find a place of service in this church, in this community, in their home. And you need to say, Lord, make me a servant, because unless you're a servant, you're not going to be truly missed when you're gone. Well, Paul's life, his manner of life was not only a life of humility, but notice also it was a life of heartache. Look at verse 19. He said, serving the Lord with all humility and many tears. He often had a broken heart. Why? Because he was a compassionate man who knew how to weep. He knew how to enter the sorrows, and the hurts of other people. That's the way to be missed. If you live for self and self alone, and you try to insulate yourself from the cares and the trials and the problems of other people, then you're not going to be missed. But you show me a person who knows how to sympathize, a person who knows how to empathize, a person who has the compassion of the Lord Jesus in his heart and in his life, and I'll show you a person who will be missed when he's gone. I want, you to, ask, I want to ask you a question. Now listen to this. Do the things that break the heart of Jesus break your heart? Do the things that cause Jesus to weep cause you to weep? Do you know how to weep? When's the last time you shed a tear over some soul that sold himself out to the devil? When you, and I tell you, we ought to have the same compassion of Jesus when he looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. They were like sheep 
without a shepherd. Jesus was a man of tears. Paul was a man of tears. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And we ought to be people of tears. Paul said, I serve the Lord with all humility. I serve the Lord, Lord with a heartache for others. And then he says, I serve the Lord with hardship. He speaks here in verse 19 of the many, many trials that he had endured. <clears throat> it means that there were people who disliked him. And Jesus said, now look, don't think that just because you follow me, everybody's going to applaud you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. And the Apostle Paul in his ministry had many, many, many people who opposed him. There were people who literally bodily harmed him because of the stand he took for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. There is no way that you can have a life that will count and make an impression on this world without making some enemies. People are going to be offended by you. And unless you're willing for these three things to be in your life, humility and heartache and hardship, you're not going to have the kind of life that the Apostle Paul had. And it's not going to be the kind of life that counts. People say, well, I'm not ready for that kind of life. I don't want that kind of life. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you're so wrapped up in yourself. But I want to tell you something. If that's your attitude, then when you're gone, it's not going to make much of a difference at all. Nobody in this world really would say, this is the way to have a great life, a life of humility and heartache and hardship. I know this, the stars in Hollywood would not, would not tell you that's the way to have a great life. And all the, <laughs> the people wrapped up in the wealth of this world would not tell you that's the way to have a great life. The pleasure seekers of this world would not tell you that's the way to have a great life. Humility, heartache, hardship, nobody wants that. They think the great life is measured by something else. But I want to say, this is the great life. This is the manner of Paul's life. He said, you know the manner of my life. That was the measure of his life. But I want you to notice a second thing that he tells us in Acts chapter 20. A life is measured not only by the manner of that life. A life is measured by the message of the life. Because you see, not only do we live a certain way, but we say a certain thing. That is, we leave behind us a message. Every one of us will be known for something when we're gone. When people think about us, what do you want them to think about you when they think about you? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I want them to think of the gospel of Jesus Christ and say this man's life was centered in the only message that matters. Okay, what kind of message did the Apostle Paul have? Notice the content <clears throat> of his message. Look at verse 20 of Acts chapter 20. He said, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but pro that I proclaimed it to you. He says, I taught you publicly from house to house, in every place, everywhere he went. And notice in verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks, that is, Every person. He didn't leave anybody out. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the content of Paul's message. This summarizes his life. Repentance and faith. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was primarily known as a gospel preacher. And it was a very narrow message, very narrow. 
He didn't stutter when he preached it. He didn't stammer. He didn't make excuses. He didn't hesitate. He kept on preaching that message. Repentance toward God. Faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice not only the content of his message. Look at the conviction of his message. Look at verse 22. And, and he says, Now I'm going bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except, verse 23, that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulation await me. Paul said, I'm on my way back to Jerusalem. And I know the Spirit of God wants me to go. I'm bound in the Spirit. And I know that, that people are saying it's going to be rough. Everywhere I go, they're testifying that I'm going to have heartache there. I'm going to have trials. I'm going to have trouble there. Bonds and afflictions await me. But now I want you to look at verse 24. He says, None of these things move me. I'm not going to be disturbed, upset, troubled by any of these things, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You want a life that counts? Dear friend, you're going to have to have a message that has the right content and the right conviction. Paul said, I am bound in the Spirit, so none of these things move me. I'm going ahead. There is, they're not going to change my course. They're not going to stop me. I tell you what, I have observed over the years, most Christians... When it comes to serving God and, and, and engaging in any kind of ministry the Lord might have, you know what they do? They say, Lord, first show me, then I'll decide. First show me what you want me to do, then I'll decide. That doesn't cut it with the Lord. You see, Paul had a grip, a tenacious grip on certain things. Are you that way? Do you know what's wrong with the average Christian? All around the world, he has opinions but not convictions. There's a difference between having an opinion and having a conviction. Paul had convictions. He said, I'm bound in the Spirit. I'm going to finish my course with joy. I'm going to do it. I know what I'm going to do. I know what's going to happen. It eventually led to his death, of course. But I'll tell you something. Paul had rather die with a conviction than live with a compromise. How about you? Are you living with a compromise? Most of us had rather live with a compromise than die with a conviction. But you can understand the kind of man that Paul was. And this shames me, really. Shames me as I think about the content of his message and the conviction of his message. Because most of us are so fearful, we'll cave in and we'll compromise rather than to live out a conviction. But I want you to notice another thing about his message Look at the confidence of his message. Paul died with confidence. Look at verse 25. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now, what did he mean by that? Paul was confident. He said, you're not going to see 
my face anymore. I'm going on to heaven. And he said, I, I want to tell you one thing. I'm, I'm very confident of this. I am innocent of the blood of all men. Now, what did he mean by that? I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Well, to understand that, you'll have to go back to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel said, we are like watchmen. We're sentries on a wall. If we see the enemy coming and we don't warn the people inside the city about the enemy, we don't tell them that they're about to die, then their blood will be required at our hands. Paul is talking about winning souls, testifying to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't tell our friends, our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they die and go to hell, their blood is on our hands. Now, let me illustrate this with a simple illustration. Let's suppose your child has some rare, nameless disease. Nobody's ever heard of that disease. There's no cure for it. And that disease is gnawing away at the life of your child. And you're, you know your child is going to die. But then there's this doctor. And this doctor has developed a certain medicine for that disease. A particular message, um, um, a, a medicine that will save your child's life. And so your child dramatically, radically got well. Okay, let's suppose that an epidemic of the same disease that your child had broke out in your city. Now you know that there is a doctor with a prescription for that disease. You know that doctor can prescribe the medicine and save the lives of those children. But you did nothing. You did nothing. You didn't tell anybody. And those children died. Wouldn't their blood be on your hands? Now listen. We know the only message that this world needs. This world is terribly diseased. We know the only medicine that will save this world, and we don't tell it, then we're guilty of high treason against heaven's king, and we're going to meet the Lord with bloody hands. Now, the apostle knew that before long, he was going to meet the Lord, and he said, I'm innocent. I'm free from the blood of all men. I'm not going to face the Lord with bloody hands. Now, some of us, some of us are going to face the Lord with blood on our hands. There are souls to whom we should have witnessed. They died, and they've gone to hell, and it's our fault. We didn't tell them. Paul had a confidence. He had a confidence about his message. He said, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. I'm free from the blood of all men. Can we say that honestly? You look at the Apostle Paul there in his cell, and he's been tried. He's aware that his execution is close at hand. And the guard comes for him. He said, it's time. You're going to the chopping block. You see, they executed a Roman citizen by chopping his head off. And so he has the chain. Paul says, you don't need to put those chains on me. I can walk. It's okay. Let's go. So the guard takes him toward the place of execution. And the greatest Christian who ever lived a little a stocky, bald-headed Jew hobbling along, his body bent, broken, scarred by a lot of whippings and stonings and imprisonments. 
And uh, there he is. And the, all of a sudden, the guard says, what's that I hear? Do I hear music? Paul, are you humming? He says, oh, well, yes, I didn't know that you were listening to me. It's just a habit of mine. A little song that we love to sing, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And the guard said, you sure are a strange one. So they get down to the place of execution. The executioner says, okay, tie him up to the chopping block. Paul says, you don't need to do that. It's okay. So he kneels down, puts his head on the chopping block. And they say, Paul, aren't, aren't you afraid? He said, oh, no, I'm not afraid. I've done this before. What do you mean you've done this before? You can't have done it before. Oh, Paul says, yes, I die daily. I die daily. They put his head on the chopping block. Any last words, Paul? Oh, yes, I'm glad you asked. Here are my last words. Jesus Christ is Lord. And the axe falls and his head rolls over into the basket. The next scene is heaven. He's looking into the face of Jesus. And he says, Lord Jesus, you know I wasn't strong. You know I wasn't a good speaker. And you certainly know I didn't have a very pleasant uh, physical appearance. I was re rather ugly. <clears throat> but, Lord, I kept the faith. I finished my job. I fought a good fight. Lord, <clears throat> these hands are innocent of the blood of all men. How would you like to meet the Lord Jesus like that? Many of us are going to meet the Lord with bloody hands. And I believe the Lord Jesus said to the Apostle Paul, Well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Paul, for being true to me. That's the measure of a life, the manner of a person's life, and the message of a person's life. But there's a third way to measure a person's life, a third way that made them miss Paul so very much not just by the manner of a person's life and the message of a person's life, but the motto of a person's life. Every one of you has a motto for your life. Now, maybe you've never put it into words, but there is a motto that impels you. There is a motto that motivates you. There is something that drives you. There's something that constrains you. Paul had a motto, and here it is. Read in, in verses 33 through 35. Paul says, I have coveted nobody's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, the Apostle Paul was a great man because he spent life primarily not as a receiver but as a giver. Therefore, his life was blessed. You see, dear friends, people in life are divided into two categories. There are the takers and there are the givers. The takers may eat better, but the givers sleep better. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. I want to tell you something. I hope you remember this statement I'm going to make to you. Write it down. Somehow remember it. When you die, all you're going to take with you is what you have given away. When you die, all that you're going to take with you is what you have given away. You see, what you have spent is gone forever. What you did not spend will be left for somebody else. But what you give away is yours forever. It's more blessed to give than to receive. I want you to see what that motto did for Paul. 
What did that philosophy do for him? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, number one, it freed him from covetousness. Look at verse 33. He said, I've coveted nobody's silver or gold or apparel. You know, covetous, by the way, the word covet literally means to have more. doesn't make any difference what you have. You, all, you want more. You got a dollar, you want a hundred dollars. You got a hundred dollars, you want a thousand dollars and so on to want more. Somebody once asked John D. Rockefeller, who at that time was the richest man in America, one of the richest men in the world. Somebody once asked Rockefeller, how much money would it take to satisfy a person? He said, just a little more, just a little more, always. I, covetousness would you believe covetousness is so great a sin, it has a commandment all to itself in the Bible. You shall not covet. And um, in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 5, we're told, let your lifestyle be without covetousness. You see, this is such a great sin, it gives root to many, many other sins. Why do people steal? Why do they lie? Why do they cheat? You see, it's all because of covetousness. And the Bible says that covetousness is idolatry. Read it. Ephesians 5.5, 5, Colossians 3.5. Covetousness is idolatry because that's what you're worshiping material things, possessions. And you see, Paul says, I remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Therefore, I, I didn't covet anything that belonged to anybody else. But notice also, it freed him from laziness, from idleness. Look at verse 34. Now look, you know that the, these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I worked for my needs. And also I worked to help other people in need. What Paul is saying is there are people who are weak. There are some people who cannot work. There are people who have needs. And Paul said, I worked not only just to support myself, but to help the needy. Now, the Bible says that if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. But the Bible also recognizes there are some people who cannot work. And those of us who can work need to help those who are weak. And <clears throat> this is the principle that the Apostle Paul lays down before us right here. Another thing about Paul's motto, about it's more blessed to give than to receive, it saved him from selfishness. Notice what he says here. Uh, I've, I support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Nobody has a great life if he lives a selfish life. Nobody. The Apostle Paul lived a life of giving, not taking, of helping, not hurting, of loving and lifting and caring. I want to tell you a true story. I, I read this in the archives, World War II. The Nazis came into a Polish village. And, of course, you know, they rounded up all the Jews everywhere they went, took them to an a, a, a concentration camp, and in those early days, they'd shoot them right there on the spot. They'd exterminate them. That was their, their goal, to um, exterminate the Jewish race. So they, in this village, they rounded up all the Jews, brought them out of their houses, took them out to this field, and they made them dig a, a deep trench, a ditch that would later become their grave. Then they stripped them of all their clothes. They lined them up on the edge of that ditch, 
and they got their machine guns and began to mow them down, bullet after bullet, flying into their flesh, and the people would topple over backwards into that grave. Well, there was a little 10-year-old boy standing there with his mother and his father. The bullets ripped into their bodies, blood spattered everywhere, but this little boy was so short, the bullets passed right over him. And as his parents and all the others fell into that ditch, he fell into that grave and lay still, but he was not touched by one bullet. And there he is in the grave. And of course, they assumed that everybody was dead because he was all splattered with blood. And uh, they began to push the dirt over the bodies of all those people. And they buried that 10 year old boy alive. But his face was in such a position that it caught a pocket of air from the bodies around him. And the ground was not packed that hard. And he could actually breathe under the ground. So there he is lying among the mutilated bodies of his loved ones. And after several hours, it was dark, he began to dig his way out of his own grave. He clawed and he dug his way to the surface and out of the, his own grave. There he was, naked, clotted with blood, and clotted with dirt, he went to the nearest house. It was a neighbor. He knocked on the door. The woman came. She saw that little boy, recognized him as one of the Jewish boys, and knew that he was marked for death. She screamed at him, go away, and slammed the door in his face. The little boy dragged himself over to the next house, and uh, same thing happened. Woman in terror said, I can't help you. Go away. He went to the third house, knocked on the door, and the woman opened the door, and she recognized him. Her face froze. But before she could say anything, the little boy said, Don't you know me? Don't you recognize me? I am the Jesus that you say you love. She broke and said, Come in. And at the risk of her own life, she sheltered that 10-year-old child. And Jesus said, And as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Look, there is no easy way to have a great life. But I'm telling you, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And there's some of us, when we're gone, we're not going to be missed. But there are others, when they're gone, people are going to weep sorely. Those that know the things that count. So you measure a person's life not by how, how much power he has, not by the size of his bank account, not by his intellect. You measure a person's life by the manner of that person's life, by the message of that life, and by the motto by which that person has lived. And that motto is it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I want to remind you one time, one more time. When you die, you're going to leave behind all that you have. And you're going to take with you all that you are. I want us to pray right now. And I just want, want you to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to minister to you right now as we are in prayer. Mm -hmm. 